thanks for attending, first of all. We hope to impart some useful information, useful knowledge to the crowd. And uh, I'm going to start by talking, as Jersey just explained, about some success stories from my office. Now, bear in mind that these are still hypothetical. I'll be talking about some studies that we're currently running. We have not actually implemented this bar yet in the types of structures I'll be showing. But we are evaluating uh, the use of FRP primarily in parking structures. So my office, as Jersey mentioned, we're based in Seattle. We have an office in Chicago also. And we do commercial buildings primarily. 95% of our work is urban construction, high-rise towers, a lot of high-rise apartments and office buildings, a lot of retail work. We do some institutional work. And we do quite a few parking structures both freestanding parking structures and parking structures that are parts of other buildings. If you do a parking structure, as I'm sure most all of you know, in a northern climate or along the ocean, you have chloride loading. So if you take a parking structure, for example, in Chicago or even in Seattle for that matter, uh, you have chloride loading due to vehicles that track salt into the garage. And it's a very nasty and kind of insidious problem because uh, once corrosion starts, if you don't take design and construction precautions and measures to protect against corrosion, once that corrosion begins, it's very, very difficult to stop it. And corrosion can result in huge problems with parking structures and bridge decks. We don't design bridges in my office, but but corrosion can, can wreak havoc with a parking deck. So we have been evaluating uh, the use of FRP in both short span two-way flat plate systems and also in long span systems for parking decks. And I'll show you some of that today. We also use FRP for some retrofit work that we get into uh, where we increase top reinforcing by doing saw cut strips into a slab, and then we install FRP, and I'll show you some pictures of that as well. So moving into my presentation, let's first begin with the topics that I'll cover. I'll give a brief history of FRP in concrete structures, which most of you are probably aware of, but some of this, for, uh, candidly, I wasn't until I started preparing this presentation. FRP is a new product, I think, for most designers, including me. And uh, some of the work that we researched in terms of the history of FRP I found fascinating, and I've included it here. I'll talk then about ACI 440, which of course now is the building code for the use of FRP. Came out last year. We expect it to be in the IBC next year. So finally we have a building code where we can design to it and we can get building permits and actually build things with these products. And I'll show the project examples that I just mentioned. So what is FRP? I won't read through all of this, but essentially FRP is fiber reinforced polymer. So if you think of it, if you sort of dumb it down and think it's plastic with fibers in it, and you can have different types of fibers. There are all sorts of fibers that can be used, but it's a composite material. Composite material, there are different types. You have fiberglass, which is GFRP. You have carbon fiber, basal fiber, basalt fiber, and aramid fiber, otherwise known as Kevlar. Kevlar. Uh, so different, different types of fibers can be used in these products. And I think, at least insofar as buildings are concerned, I know that FRP has been used very successfully in seawalls and I think uh, by bridge designers, bridge contractors, DOTs. It's just now making its way into the world that I live in, which is commercial buildings. And so, in fact, Having said that, uh, I don't have all the answers here today, and it's very likely I may, might say something that you would question and take exception to. Feel free to raise your hand if I do that, because I'm going to walk you through what I know about FRP and what we're doing at my office, uh, but I don't have all the answers by any means. And I will also say that a lot of what you'll see today was prepared by other people in my office, so I'm essentially speaking on their behalf. Um, anyway, moving along. So fiberglass bar, GFRP. Uh, we have the basal fiber or basal bar. We have uh, basal fiber and basal bar, and you can see the photographs there on the screen. And we have carbon fiber bar. And we have the aramid, otherwise known as Kevlar fiber. 
So we have a number of diff different types of fiber that can be used in these uh, fiber reinforced polymer products. Let's talk about the advantages of FRP. First of all, and this is the big one, it doesn't corrode. So if you use FRP in a bridge deck or a parking structure, your corrosion problems are pretty well gone. You don't need to worry about that. And uh, anybody who has worked in that field, either bridge decks, parking structures, seawalls, concrete piling installed in salt water, you know that corrosion is a really nasty problem. It's difficult to design around, it's difficult to fix once it starts, and there's an entire industry out there of people selling admixtures and products and uh, epoxy coating, you name it, to, to guard against corrosion. Stainless steel bar, galvanized bar, all sorts of uh, things are done and lots of money is spent to guard against corrosion. With FRP, the problem's off the table. Don't need to worry about it. So that's a big one for FRP. Uh, tensile strength is much higher than steel. The examples I'll show uh, today, we used 135 KSI for the tensile strength of bar that we were doing these hypothetical studies on. But the fact is that, um, and especially with the smaller bars, because the tensile strength goes up as the bar size goes down. So it's inversely correlated to bar size. Bigger bars, lower tensile strength, smaller bars, much higher tensile strength. That's a big one. It's lightweight. And in the studies that we have done, in the one case, we took the study far enough. It's a, a long span parking structure, a massive one. Uh, and I won't mention the name of the owner because you would all recognize who it is. And we might, might start some Rumors that, that I don't need to be part of, but in any event, it's a massive parking structure uh, for a very large user, very large company that may or may not get built uh, because they're questioning whether or not they really want to, to build this or not now. But we did do a study, and we took the study far enough to actually evaluate the relative cost of the FRP versus the steel. And one of the advantages that the contractor believes will accrue to the FRP is the productivity rates go up in the field. So the bars are much lighter. So a workman, for example, can pick up an entire bundle of FRP, throw it over his shoulder, and move 10 or 15 bars across the deck, as opposed to steel, where it might be only two or three bars. Typically, a workman is not going to pick up much more than about 100 pounds. In fact, unions often have regulations against that. So if you have a bar that weighs more, more than 200 pounds, and I know we have some contractors here in the office who might be able to speak to that later, but the bottom line is as rebar gets too heavy, workmen don't pick it up without assistance. So if you have a number 11 bar, for example, that's steel, that's 5.3 pounds per lineal foot. If that bar is, say, 50 feet long, that bar weighs over 250 pounds. So it, you need assistance. You need more than two guys to pick that bar up and move it around. With FRP, you cut that weight by 75%. So big deal, that's a big deal. And the contractor that we were working with on this, this large uh, long span parking structure that may or may not go forward, um, was convinced that there would be higher productivity rates in the field. He didn't know how to price them though. And so they basically are holding, um, they're kind of holding that in advance. They didn't factor that into their pricing because they know it will be there but they don't know how much it will be. So that, that essentially becomes a contingency in the use of FRP. They have a little pot of money there on the side of their estimate that they know they can use, but they just don't know how big or small it is until they actually build a few buildings with FRP. So that's a big one. Um, and uh, let's see, easy to move in the job site. And then of course we have low electrical and thermal conductivity. And the electrical in particular is a big advantage for FRP because if you're involved with any hospital work, or hospitals or medical clinics uh, commonly have an MRI now, an MRI machine, which is magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetism and steel don't work very well. And so, and we've done a couple of those in my office over the years. And uh, normally when you have an MRI machine, you need to design the building such that you have no uh, metals, no steel rebar in the case of the structure, within, depending on the magnet, it can be 50 or 100 feet of the magnet. So the floor the magnet sits on needs to be designed with something other than steel rebar. So that's an advantage for FRP. The disadvantages <clears throat> of FRP. 
First of all, it's brittle. So if you look at the stress drain curve for FRP, it ascends until it yields, and when it yields, it ruptures. If you look at steel, oop. if you look at steel, of course, we know that you have a, typically a well-defined yield point, and then you have a very long strain hardening phase, a big long plateau, which gives steel its ductility. FRP doesn't have that, so that's one of the disadvantages, and that is factored into the way we design with it. Uh, storage and handling can be a little more restrictive. It can be damaged by UV light overexposure, improper cutting, or aggressive handling. So because it's brittle, very strong and brittle, it, is, it takes a little bit more caution and care on the part of the workman to handle it. Uh, higher initial cost than traditional steel, that is a moving target at the moment. And the projects that I'll show you here today, um, the contractor priced it out two or three different ways and was getting different pricing each time. So my guess is, like a lot of new products, that as demand grows, the pricing will stabilize and likely diminish. That would be the hope. As demand grows, I think the pricing structure will become much easier for contractors to anticipate. And I've seen this with other new products over the years. As we design with and use and implement new ideas, um, the initial pricing always comes back high because contractors carry a lot of risk and they don't want to underestimate the price of implementing a new idea. And because of that, they'll put a big contingency somewhere in their estimate because they just don't know. They don't fully understand what they're getting into. So um, that I think will stabilize as demand grows. The initial cost though, and this was a big factor in the parking studies that, that I'll show you. The initial cost can be moderated and actually overcome by the fact that if you use FRP in a parking deck, you can reduce your clear cover. And where we're proposing to use it and where we think we will use it will be for top reinforcing in parking structures where we have chloride loading um, in northern climates. And if we reduce the clear cover to the steel, we can basically uh, save, in, in the case of the garages I'll show you, we, we reduced the clear cover by a half inch, so we went from two inch clear cover to an inch and a half, and then we took that half inch of concrete savings and credited that to the, need to avoid this microphone, we credited that to the FRP. We also, uh, especially in the long span garage, because that's in a location where chloride loading is very heavy, in the long span garage, we decided that if we used FRP, we could eliminate the use of calcium nitrite admixtures. So calcium nitrites are commonly used uh, in areas of heavy chloride loading to increase the passivating layer around the steel. By using a calcium nitrite, you can essentially uh, raise the corrosion threshold. So bare black steel, so-called black bar, at roughly 300 to 310 parts per million of chloride at the level of steel will start to corrode. And once that begins, it's a nasty problem. You can raise that 300 to two or three fold with enough calcium nitrite in the concrete. So with the use of FRP, our thought is we don't need the calcium nitrite. So we reduce the clear cover, and that saves concrete. We also eliminate the calcium nitrite, which saves a lot of money in the mix. The combination of those two savings were more than the premium for the FRP bar. So the FRP was a little higher, but the savings of concrete and calcium nitrite were much greater. Did a size offset in a uh, shrinkage and temperature control situation like that, uh, like a three versus four bar factor into the cost as well too, the cost savings as well too? Um, well, first of all, why don't we hold the questions oh, until the end? But that, that's okay. Since you asked, I'll go ahead and respond. We'll save the remaining questions till the end. But his question was, did the size offset for shrinkage and temperature reinforcing save money? In other, in other words, what you're saying, I think, is be, if we were able to reduce the bar size for shrinkage and temperature because of the higher yield strength, we didn't use it in the studies I'm looking at for shrinkage and temperature. But I think if we had, um, probably the answer would be yes. There would be additional savings there. So, good question. Um, and let's see. Finally, the higher susceptibility to heat, and of course that's a big one, I'm sure you're all aware of that, but 
the fire resistance of FRP, the, the heat resistance, I should say, is lower. So uh, there's been a long debate with a lot of people that I won't get into, but the fact is that you need to be very, very careful with FRP if you're using it in an area where you expect high heat. Uh, and there's another thing to be aware of that I don't have on the disadvantage list, and that's that FRP, because of the brittle nature of the bar, is not appropriate for regions of high seismicity. So the way that 440 defines that, ACI 440, is for seismic design categories uh, A, B, and C, you can use FRP, D, E, F, you cannot. In seismic design category A, you can use it in the seismic system and the vertical load carrying system. Design categories B and C, you can use it only in the gravity system but not the lateral. That's the way 440 defines it. Now my understanding is that there is still an ongoing debate between ACI and ICC about that, but I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but I understand that ICC initially pushed back and said they wanted FRP only in seismic design category. Is that true, Jersey? I think we have Will here. Well, there's the man. But if ICC limits it to A, when it goes into the International Building Code in 2024, that will be a, a limitation they're imposing, right? Okay, interesting. That's as I thought. So to sum that up, 440 is saying we can use it anywhere we'd like in seismic design category A. In B and C, we can use it in the gravity system but not the lateral system, and we don't use it at all in D, E, and F. But ICC, which is the International Code Council, in their code that comes out next year, will restrict it only to seismic design category A, unless that changes, which I suppose is still unknown. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, anyway, we've cleared that up. So moving along, I want to talk about this issue of heat just for a moment because there is some controversy about what heat really does to structures and so forth. Coincidentally, in a parking structure that we were involved in in my office, a few years ago, Charleston, South Carolina, a car fire occurred last year. So there's a picture of the garage. So if you fly into Charleston um, and rent a car, you'll walk through this parking structure. Or if you live in Charleston and park and go to the airport, you'll also use this garage. It's the, the brand new garage for the Charleston, South Carolina airport. And they're going to be expanding it, by the way, by about four or 5,000 more cars. So we're starting work on that very soon. But very large parking structure, just built a few years back, and last year a fire occurred. You can see the fire there on the left. That was a Ford F-150 pickup that caught fire, and it burned for apparently better part of an hour, 30, 45 minutes. The picture on the right shows the car which literally melted. The car was just a heap of, there's kind of a red uh, screen behind it to keep people away from walking around it. But there were a number of cars damaged, the one that burned and some cars that were adjacent. And then what happened to the uh, garage itself, so here's the deck above. So on the left-hand photo, you can actually see the post-tensioning cables that failed. So the concrete spalled significantly uh, as a result of the fire. The cables failed, it resulted in a big retrofit project because these are unbonded cables and for those of you who are familiar with post-tensioning, if, if an unbonded cable fails anywhere, it fails everywhere. So if you fail it anywhere along its length, you've lost the entire cable. So we had to go in and do a bunch of retrofit to fix that garage. But the reason I show that is because, um, first of all, the heat is, is, is per ASTM E119 and traditional building practice assumed to be primarily on the bottom of a slab, the soffit. The top of the slab, by the way, where the pickup sat, more or less intact. No spalling, no apparent damage. So the slab the pickup was sitting on was not seriously damaged. The soffit above was, those are the pictures you're looking at. And so our thinking is that in a parking structure, even if you don't have a fire rating, if you build an open parking structure, in most jurisdictions, you're not required to have rated construction. 
like you are in a building like this. A building like this, the primary structure would be required to have a three-hour rating, which would be the columns. Uh, the slabs, which are secondary, would be a two-hour rating. So this would be a two-hour fire rating. Uh, and a three-hour fire rating for all the columns and shear walls. But in a parking garage, if you qualify as an open garage, which means natural ventilation, so if you're a naturally ventilated garage, you don't have to have a fire rating, which means that the top reinforcing is a really good target for conversion to FRP because we don't need to worry about the heat, and the heat is primarily on the slab soffit anyway, which was evidenced in this fire, so the top steel can be converted to FRP without any heat issues. The bottom steel, not so much. Even if it's a non-rated garage, my belief is we should be careful in converting bottom steel in a garage to FRP. And the other thing about the bottom steel, if the chloride loading is coming from cars, then we don't have chloride loading at the bottom steel anyway, at least not for a long, long time, because the chloride is saturating through the top of the slab. So the chloride ion concentrations increase as you go deeper into the concrete. Uh, the top steel is typically where we're worried about corrosion. By the time you get to the bottom of the slab, not an issue. So with that as a starting point, um, and I'll get to the examples here in a moment, but some interesting history, and this is part of what we dug up just in doing research on FRP. We discovered that at Disneyland, in the uh, 1950s, they built a house that they called the House of the Future. And they built this using FRP products. So this was part of Tomorrowland at Disneyland. And the house was extremely popular. People would tour through it. I'm not quite sure what they had inside the house. I think they had a lot of uh, what at the time were high-tech utensils and equipment, so on and so forth, to show people what a house would look like in the future. And 10 years later, in 1967, they decided to dismantle it, demolish it. And when they took a wrecking ball to it, the wrecking ball bounced off. The wrecking ball bounced off this FRP house. And that was apparently one of the first indicators of the incredible potential of FRP, that this amazing material, they had to dismantle it with hand tools, I think. I mean, they couldn't demolish it with a wrecking ball. So it was an indication that, boy, there's some real potential for this material for use in buildings. And that, I thought, was quite revealing in terms of what NEX is working to do and what designers like myself are interested in, that we have this really strong material that, uh, that we know can, can be used uh, with great effect and great success in buildings. Uh, let's talk about ACI 440 briefly. I'm sure you're all aware of this, but 440 came out with a design guide in 2015. They issued last year their building code with specification. That now has been adopted by ICC, and it will be part of the IBC 24 next year. So that's now the design code that we're working with. And let me now get into some examples. And I want to start by talking about the um, just a couple of the important issues that designers like myself or my office need to deal with when they're working with FRP, beginning with development length. So there is the development length equation for FRP. And you know what, every time I look at these in the current codes, I have to chuckle because I think back to Jim Cagley. Jim Cagley chaired 318. Uh, I think he was the chair right after I got on. I served on 318 for about 20 years. And Jim was the chair not long after I joined the committee. And I remember Jim Cagley always talking about these development length equations saying, God, why can't we just go back to 24 bar diameters and 30 bar diameters and 40 bar diameters? It was so simple because that's how we used to design building structures. And now we have equations like this. So they're much more refined, but they, and they keep software writers busy because you could write some nice software to deal with that, that development length equation. But there was a time when we would, we would determine development length and splice lengths by just taking a multiple of bar diameters. It was pretty simple and pretty quick and easy for guys like me to zip through a design. Anyway, that is our equation for development length in 440. And you can see it's a linear function. If you look at the numerator, it's a lineal function of the bar rupture stress. And so as that rupture stress increases, development length goes up. So the important takeaway is development lengths for FRP are longer than for steel rebar. So development length is considerably longer because of the high rupture strength, yield strength for FRP. That's number one. 
Number two, flexural strength. If the section is compression controlled, which counterintuitively is what we want, with steel rebar, we're all trained from the time we start school to think about a tension controlled failure. We don't want compression controlled failures. We want the steel to yield because we know we have this big long steel yield plateau uh, and some strain hardening and that's what we're trying to achieve with flexural design of steel. With FRP it's just the opposite. If we have a compression controlled failure that is actually more ductile than a tension controlled failure because tension controlled is rupture. When you hit yield you rupture. So we get a uh, higher fee factor which I'll show you here in a moment if we're compression controlled. But for flexural strength if we're compression controlled, it's identical to rebar. There's no difference. Those equations are what we use for designing with rebar. With um, a rupture controlled failure, they change a little bit. The compression block is calculated differently. The D minus A over two, which is the moment arm. For those of you who are structural engineers or designers, we have a moment arm that we calculate based on the depth of the compression block the calculation of that changes just a bit with FRP. So that's the essential difference. Uh, and the fee factors, 0.55 if we are tension controlled, which is rupture of the FRP material, and we can go as high as 0.65 if we are compression controlled. So those are three, uh, three among others. There are other idiosyncrasies and differences, but those I think for designers are three of the real important ones. The development length is longer, the, um, the fee factors are considerably lower, and the calculation of moment strength for the tension controlled condition is different. And let's move now into an actual building. So here is a hypothetical design of a two-way slab system. This is a building in my office that we are not using FRP on, but we did do a study just to see what would happen if we were to use FRP because we're very interested in the potential for solving this corrosion problem with uh, FRP reinforcing products. The other thing about corrosion, you know, with calcium nitrite, for example, if you, if you use calcium nitrite in your mix to guard against corrosion in a slab, whether it's a parking deck, uh, a bridge deck, anything uh, susceptible to or, or exposed to chloride, um, Calcium nitride is great. It does increase the passivating layer around the steel. It, it raises the corrosion threshold as long as the concrete is uncracked. But like with a lot of these chemical admixtures that do great things for uh, corrosion protection, if the concrete cracks, there's no benefit. The calcium nitride is useless. So if you have a parking slab, and it's very common in big concrete slabs, find a concrete slab anywhere, a large concrete slab that doesn't have at least one crack. Pretty hard to find, right? So with parking structures, despite our best intent during design and great construction, you put them through a few uh, thermal cycles, winter to summer, you load them up, use them for a couple of years, you're gonna have a few cracks. You're gonna have some cracks. And when they crack, the calcium nitrite is essentially useless because now you're gonna have chloride saturating that steel. So you have to be cognizant of that when you're making decisions about durability in garages or bridge decks that you will have some cracks somewhere, and when you do, what is, your, what is your corrosion protection? The calcium nitride is not it. That's where you either need uh, galvanizing or epoxy or stainless steel or reinforcing that doesn't corrode. So we, we think that is, is a big, big issue because I've seen a lot of structures in my career, uh, many of which we've designed, where despite our best intentions and uh, controlling slab shrinkage and everything else, we still get some cracking, and then we have to go out and deal with what do we do now. So uh, here's a two-way system. You can see the slab there uh, in front of you. And uh, to give you just a little bit of intel on how we went about this, we, we separated, if you've designed two-way slab systems, uh, you know that the top steel is controlled either by flexure, by strength, or controlled by code minimums. So even if you don't need the top steel for strength, you can't drop the quantity below a certain threshold. So you have to have code minimum top steel, and then you add more to that if you need the top steel for flexural strength. So in this particular job, let me go to uh, 
actually, let me go backwards. Yeah, okay. This particular job, the interior columns, I think there were eight locations. Um, the top steel was controlled by strength. All of the other columns, it was code minimum. Where it was controlled by code minimum, there's no real direction in PT slabs on what to do with FRP. And that is something I'm sure uh, 320, I hope, will be working on, maybe 440 in conjunction with 320, but that's a problem yet to be dealt with. The code minimum for a two-way slab system is .00075 HL, so .00075 times the slab thickness times the span length. That's your code minimum steel. And you cannot drop below that, even if you don't need the steel for flexure. You can't drop below that level. We used that equation for conversion of steel to FRP, and that may or may not be appropriate. We think, um, arguably, we could use even a little less than that because of the higher yield strength of FRP, but we didn't drop it below that level because that currently is, is what the code would mandate, .00075 HL for a minimum steel. So that's what controlled the steel for all of the columns except the interior columns, which were controlled by strength. So now if we look at the savings that accrued in this conversion, and don't think on your screen you can't read this, so I'll just talk you through it real quickly. Where you see red, that's where we were actually, actually able to create some savings. So where you see the red in the right there, uh, that's the conversion of the steel rebar to FRP. And essentially what we showed is we could reduce the cross-sectional area of of steel by 10 to 13 percent by converting from steel to FRP at the columns where the steel is strength controlled. So a 10 to 13 percent reduction in cross-sectional area, which is significant. Um, you know, it, it's not a game changer in terms of cost. It's a big game changer in terms of corrosion because if we build with FRP, the corrosion problem is gone. But um, it, it, is a, it is a reduction of 10 to 13 percent. The development lengths, though, increase the length of the bar where we need it for flexure. So it netted out to about a one-to-one -one trade off, about a one-to-one -one trade off going from steel to FRP, which we thought was a real success story. Um, it may not sound like a success story, but we think that is. Because if we can get, if we can eliminate corrosion without a, without a premium, you know, if you're involved with new or if you're uh, doing anything in the world of sustainability, there's the term green premium. What's the premium to go green? How much more do we need to spend to bring the industry down to carbon neutrality? What's the cost of that? If we can convert from rebar to, to uh, FRP, eliminate the corrosion problem with no premium, that's a big success. So that's, that's pretty much the way the two-way system netted out. In, uh, in locations where we have minimum steel, controlled by code minimums, uh, no reduction. We just basically did a one-to-one -one trade off. So because we used the equation 0 .00075 for FRP and for steel. But the essence of the two-way uh, design was that we had a slight reduction in cross-sectional area. We had to increase the development length. The two canceled each other. So about the same quantity of reinforcing for FRP versus steel. We did not factor in the productivity improvement with FRP, which as I mentioned earlier, we know is there because contractors have all agreed with us that, that they can build these faster, they can handle more steel. They can also ship more steel to the job site. If you've ever watched a flatbed truck uh, loaded with rebar driving down the freeway, and you'll look at the truck and think, wow, why don't, why don't they put more steel on that truck? You'll see three or four bundles of steel on a flatbed, right? And you never see more than three or four bundles of steel on a flatbed truck, rebar. That's because they've reached the load capacity of the truck and the roadways. It doesn't take much rebar to, to fully load a flatbed. So with FRP, you could put about four times as much reinforcing on that flatbed. So you make one quarter as many trips to the job site with all of your reinforcing. See? So that's an advantage that nobody quite knows how to price yet what those savings really are, but we know they're there. All right, let's move into a two, uh, pardon me, a one-way system. So this is a one-way uh, slab design. This is another project in my office that we looked at as a hypothetical uh, northern state. 
chloride loading off the street, cars and trucks that come into the garage, um, low seismic zone. So we need low seismicity, um, chloride loading to motivate us to want to go to FRP. And so we looked at this as a hypothetical, and what we found here, similar to what we discovered with the two-way plate system, was that the conversion of, F to, of um, rebar to FRP, it reduces the cross-sectional area, but we lengthen the bar because of development, and they net out pretty close to one-to-one. -to -one. So our thought on a long-span garage would be if we can take all of the top rebar, if we can convert to FRP, eliminate the corrosion problem, reduce the clear cover by a half an inch, which we decided we would do here. So we take, this was going to have been a seven inch slab, and we would drop that to six and a half, so we have a half inch of concrete savings. We remove the calcium nitrite admixture, so we have savings from the reduction in concrete, the elimination of calcium nitrite. We can actually save a little money on the long span system, we, we came, if we had this priced out by a contractor, actually, uh, it came out to about a 5%, a little less than that maybe, savings on the slab system for FRP versus rebar, which was big. Because if we've eliminated corrosion and we've actually saved a little money doing it, it's a home run. It's a home run. So we're not going forward with it yet, but we think there's real potential in the future. Uh, show you what we plan to do with the beam. So here's a cross section through one of the long span beams. This, by the way, is a very traditional long span garage. These are 60 foot bays vertically. So in the up down direction, those are 60 foot bays and transverse about 25. And we do them anywhere from 18 out to about 28 or 30 in terms of the horizontal base spacing. The vertical dimension is typically right around 60 to 62, depending on the municipality you're working in and the parking requirements they have. But um, very traditional long span garage. If you look at the beam again, cross section through the beam. So this is a traditional so-called Cunningham beam because the forming system was developed by a man named Art Cunningham many, many years ago and is, has continued to bear his name when people use it. But a Cunningham garage, this beam, the bottom dimension is 16 inches. The top dimension is 18, so the beam is drafted one inch on the side. That's so you can strip the forms. So the form drops down because of the taper on the side. Um, and we typically put stirrups in these beams that flare out into the slab to allow placement of PT and bar. So that's why the ears and the stirrup turn out into the slab instead of in over the top of the beam. Facilitates placement. So that's a very traditional detail. Our thought here is that we simply drop the stirrup ears, those hooks at the top of the stirrup, we drop those down a couple of inches, and this, this detail doesn't reflect that, but if this was an FRP drop, we, we would drop the top of the stirrup down a bit, we would lower those two horizontal top bars with the stirrup, so we essentially push the steel down towards the bottom of the slab. So the beam steel gets pushed to the bottom of the slab, that way we can continue to work with steel in the beam convert the slab top rebar to FRP and not need to worry about corrosion in the beam bars. So that's, that's our thinking going forward. Um, one final example I want to show you is slab strengthening. So we do occasionally, not a lot, but we get involved in projects, usually they're our own, um, where we design an office building, for example, and then they start putting tenants into the building, and a tenant comes along and they want to put a rolling filing system in. And these rolling filing systems that push all the filing off to one location can have live loads up to 200 pounds per square foot, huge. And since we're typically designing office buildings for quite a bit less than that, you know, we're usually in the 75, 80, 85 pound per square foot live load capacity, uh, it's very common in office buildings to have local areas that need to be strengthened. So what we've done here in recent years, uh, not always, but on a few occasions, is we will saw cut parallel strips into the floor slab, which you see in the right photo. So we're looking down at the saw cut strips. We'll saw cut those strips down an inch and a half, let's say, sometimes a little deeper. And then we'll drop, you can see this better in the next photo, we will drop uh, FRP strips of varying types into those 
saw cuts, and then we put an adhesive product in, essentially an epoxy product, to glue the FRP to the concrete. It's very, very, very effective, and contractors love it. Um, it can be done fairly quickly. It's a way of increasing the top reinforcing in a slab without tearing it all apart and rebuilding it. So we have found, and that's a fairly traditional strategy. It's not something we developed, but uh, it's been in the market for a long time, and we have found it to be very useful and very successful. That is my final slide, so thank you very much, and happy to take some questions. Question right here. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Hossein from University of Miami. Thanks for the great presentation. I think uh, now is the time to see uh, the case studies that people are doing with the FRP after all the first expert doing in the committees to publish the documents for, for the design. Uh, actually, I did some work in uh, PT GFRP uh, in, in, in the flat slabs, so in the, in the two-way design. Uh, I, I want to see how did you finally design your section as a tension controlled or a compression controlled? Because in the design, I saw that uh, the serviceability is not the issue anymore because the post-tensioning cables are uh, governing the design and taking care of the serviceability. But in the, in the regular RC with the GFRP, the serviceability is the issue. And that's why we go for the compression control. But in my design, I didn't see that and I was, was like, as you, as you did, so I replaced the GFRP with the steel one by one because the serviceability was not the issue anymore. I want to see how did you see it in the design? Did you uh, get the same thing? And also what did you use as the fee factor for the GFRP? That's a great question. And let me explain that. For serviceability in post-tension slabs, the reduction in modulus of FRP is not an issue. And I think most of you probably know that the modulus of FRP is quite a bit less than steel. So it's much stronger, but the modulus is quite a bit lower. The modulus we were working with in our conversions was right around 8 million. So the modulus for the FRP is about 8 million. If you're designing a traditional mild reinforced slab without post-tensioning, that's a big issue because your crack section stiffness really plummets with that reduction in modulus. And the stiffness and the serviceability will control the amount of FRP you use because you need to gain that stiffness back by just putting more cross-sectional area into the slab. With PT, on the other hand, post-tensioning, and most of what we do in my office for slab design, probably 80 or 90 percent is post-tension because we just think it has so many advantages for most everything we do, and we do mostly commercial buildings. Uh, so we're normally post-tensioning our slabs. With post-tensioning, you're picking up typically 75 to 90 percent of the, of the self-weight of the slab. So if you have an 8-inch slab, weighs 100 pounds per square foot, you'll typically balance about, call it 85 pounds per square foot with the post-tensioning. So you're picking up most of the self-weight. You're working with uncracked sections. That's the nature of post-tensioning and pre-stressing. So you have uncracked sections. So the reduction in modulus of the steel is not an issue. It doesn't matter. So the serviceability does not control the design for PT. Uh, that's something that to my knowledge, no one is yet really working on with 320 or 440 or 318, but it's something that needs to be dealt with. Uh, because the use of FRP in post-tension slabs, I think, has more potential than for mild reinforced slabs. Um, so that's part of it. Now, in terms of what we assumed, we assumed to be safe and conservative that uh, we were tension controlled. So we used a fee factor of 0.55. So the conversion we used was arguably uh, a little too conservative, potentially. And it might be that the savings are even greater if we had gone through a careful calculation to decide if we were tension controlled or compression controlled. But we did assume a fee of 0.55. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. OK, I have a question. My name is David Lang. I'm from the University of, of Illinois. You mentioned uh, about code minimum. Uh, for the, re the cross-sectional area, yeah. and you said that that was part of the um, kind of cost comparison issue, and that in your case study you had 13% of the um, 
I guess it implies that there was 87 percent of the of the cases through the geometry had to stay confined by that code minimum. And then you made some remark about that whole topic of code minimum is going to be addressed or is still being studied. It sounded to me like that was saying that some of the benefits of these types of bars is being held back somehow, that we can do better if we were given the chance to sharpen our pencils and, and readdress the code minimum issue. Is that kind of what you meant to say? Yeah, that, that there's that, more to get into. That that's a good way of, of paraphrasing what I said, David. Is that when I was talking code minimums in a two-way plate, if you've designed two-way post-tension flat plates, you have a code minimum of 0 0.00075 times h times l, your span length. So you calculate that, and you cannot go below that amount of reinforcing, even if you don't need it. If you compute your flexural requirements and you have enough PT cable in your slab to satisfy strength, doesn't matter. You have, to, you have to provide that code minimum amount of rebar. The question becomes, how do you convert that from rebar to FRP? And there's no direction on that. Yep. So we just went ahead and used the, the rebar code minimum. And there's also, there is, there is some in the commentary, I believe, to that part of the code. Uh, there's something to the effect that that code minimum applies regardless of FY, regardless of yield strength. So we took that to mean that, okay, so if we convert to FRP, even though our yield strength went up, we still need that code minimum. But maybe um, if the yield strength goes from, say, 60 up to 135, maybe those minimums could drop. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where... And, do you, and that will come with time as people... Well, I, I think so. You know, I don't know if anybody's studying that. I, I talked with Carol Hayek. She's our chair for 320. Uh, but we were talking a lot of other things. We didn't talk about FRP. Um, and if I see her, I'll bring that up. Uh, and 440, I'm not sure if they're working on that or not. But I think, to, to my way of thinking, you know, if you look at, if you look at U.S. practice for cast-in-place concrete, I would guess that at least two-thirds of the structures that are built, whether they're office, hotel, multifamily, parking, are post-tensioned, if they're cast in place. Now, if they're precast, of course, often they're pre-tensioned. Uh, but regardless, they're pre-stressed. So if you look at cast in place concrete, the majority of time that slab system is going to have some post-tensioning in it. And um, I think the beauty of that is we don't need to worry about the reduction in stiffness due to the drop in modulus. Mm -hmm. Because we're not working with cracked sections, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. We're working with gross sections. Mm -hmm. So that's where we think it has so much potential, because now we can benefit from the strength without worrying about the reduction in modulus. Any other questions? Hey, doing, Kerry? Hey. I'm in with Related. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, so in your two-way slab example, you were mentioning certain locations where you'd be able to save on the corrosion inhibitor admixture, where at columns you were able to convert to the FRP. Um, my question is basically, how's the contractor going to you know, avoid putting that into certain loads, especially if these columns that can convert are sort of spaced randomly throughout the job, if that makes sense? Yeah. But maybe I didn't explain that carefully enough because the calcium nitride admixture goes only in the slab mix. Yeah. And it's in there for corrosion protection because that's where we're worried about the corrosion is in the slab in a parking deck. And if we remove that from the slab mix entirely, uh, we typically require about two gallons per cubic yard of calcium nitride where we use it, sometimes a little higher, sometimes three or four. But normally it's two, gallon, two gallons of calcium nitride per cubic yard. and. Um, Gosh, it can be $25, $30, $35 per yard premium for the calcium nitrate. I think in some markets like San Francisco, probably 40 because things are so expensive here. I mean, there's no place more expensive in this country than right here in the Bay Area, right? But, uh, but it's very expensive. And if we take it out entirely of the slab and we use FRP instead, that's where the savings comes in. I, th I thought you said certain columns, though, had the, the governing factor for the top steel was the area but, of steel. But, but that would have nothing to do with the calcium nitrate. That's just simply a matter of can we reduce the steel a lot or a little or any at all. You know? Okay, so you don't care about, but you're not protecting that top steel with 
the well, we are we are and we would still use frp so that two-way plate oh. i showed where we oh had you're some, just using FRP. yeah we're, we're still converting all of the top steel okay. to frp yeah. it's just that the interior columns we do the conversion differently than we do the exterior columns because the interior columns have more load and they need more steel and so we're actually able to get a bigger benefit for the interior columns than the edge columns. Yeah. The edge columns have minimum steel, even if they don't need it. They have certain minimum steel requirements. Uh, but, but every column would be converted to FRP. Got it. Every column. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for, for the uh, information and the presentation. Um, I was interested in, you spoke to thermal conductivity of FRP, but um, has there been any definitive um, evaluation or, or uh, thought given to um, what the, the relative uh, coefficient of thermal expansion is of FRP versus concrete? And, and if so, what sort of durability issues does that present? God, these questions are almost like they were planted. They're so good. These are great questions. <laughs> That's another good question. And I was actually, you know, I, I am not totally up to speed on, on the answer to that. My understanding is the coefficient of, bend this thing out of the way. The coefficient of thermal expansion contraction is much higher for FRP. And as a result of that, if you have a parking deck in an area where you're gonna have very hot summers and very cold winters, you're getting a lot of thermal loading. Um, that would need to be evaluated. I don't know the answer to that. I know that uh, it would be an issue. The beauty of steel, of course, is the coefficients are very similar. So with rebar, you can have a deck that in August is 100 degrees in the sun, and in January it's at minus 10. It doesn't matter because they expand and shrink at the same rate. Uh, I, I don't believe that's true with FRP, so that's something that a person would need to consider. If you had a, especially at the top level, one of the things that we have found with parking structures, open parking structures, uh, is that the top level gets beat up a whole lot more than the levels below it. The top level is more susceptible to freeze-thaw damage. The top level gets hotter in July and August because of the direct sun. It gets colder in January. So the levels below the top are a little more sheltered than that top level. So it might be that if you took a long span garage and converted to FRP, you might convert all levels except maybe the very top, where you would want to keep rebar for reasons of thermal expansion contraction. Those are the kinds of things that the industry needs to sort out, and that's why sessions like this are so helpful, because we're all learning from each other, right? So very, very good questions. Thank you, Kerry, for the presentation. My name is Fadi Rojdi, and I'm the VP of Rhino Carbon Fiber. Uh, we're supplying carbon fiber straps and, and stuff like that. So my question is, for the FRP rebar, how contractors are getting uh, on the bending on site for the FRP, similar to like steel rebar? Can uh, they do that? Yeah, or? well, you know, now on site bending, for those of you unfamiliar, there are markets like Manhattan, for example, where I think they still require that all rebar fabrication be done on the job site. You may or may not be aware of that, but that's a union requirement. So if you build a big building in Manhattan, be careful. You can't, you can't pre-bend your bar and ship it off to the job. You have to take it off to the job site and bend it on the bar. In fact, I think you have to do some level of fabrication on the site in Manhattan. Uh, and so, in fact, another interesting factoid in Manhattan was post-tensioning was almost never used in Manhattan for union reasons because post-tensioning would reduce labor requirements and speed up a job. <laughs> but, and you know, somehow, <laughs> so I guess that's a bad thing. We're speeding up construction. Uh, so post-tensioning was essentially held out of Manhattan for many years because it's too good. Uh, but uh, those are little idiosyncrasies that vary from one market to another in terms of the bending of FRP on a job site, which I think was your question. I'm not sure how that would be handled. I guess if you did a job in Manhattan and converted from bar, you can't do it. So, so you'd have to, but you'd have to do that in advance. So, you know. Yeah. Okay. have done it. 
with the metal couplers. And uh, again, I think people are working on coupler systems, especially for the bridge market. Yes. So did everybody hear the answer to the question? You're not going to bend it anyway. If it's FRP, you're going to ship it to the job site. Bent. Yeah. I think that answered your question. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much.